You're listening to 94.4 FM Salford City Radio, the Friday Sports Show. You're listening to Salford City Radio, the Friday Sports Show on 94.4 FM with your host, Jim Bertruzzi, bringing you news from the local area and around the world. And we're very fortunate in this show to interview the world's best athletes, sports people, people who work in sport across a wide range of disciplines, coaches, psychologists, we speak to trainers, fitness coaches. We also have a segment which is international perspectives. We speak to people who coach around the world. We've been to pretty much every corner of the globe and spoke to many people who give us an insight to what it's like to coach in this environment. And we also have a segment where we speak to some of the world's most influential people in the field of psychology and related fields who speak about their own take on mental health and related fields. So they have a, a guest who is probably you know, as, as good as qualified to give us an international perspective. He's uh, UEFA Pro Licensed Coach and worked around the world. Currently he's head coach, United City in the Philippines. So um, I don't think there's anyone else I can think of who can give us a better perspective on what it's like to coach uh, abroad than today's guest. Jason Wiff, welcome to the show. Great to have you on board. Yes, good to be here. Great to have you on board. I, I mean, if we just start from the beginning, Jason, you sort of coach pretty much everywhere, so many different places, but how did you sort of get into coaching in the beginning? How did you sort of turn your hand into coaching? Uh, well, for myself, it was, uh, I mean, I was growing up with football. My father was a, was a professional footballer, um, was lucky enough to play at the highest level. I, I went into football myself. I uh, didn't reach the, the, the same sort of heights as what he, he reached. I uh, came out again due to injury and then I went into coaching. Um, my sort of introduction with coaching was with Birmingham City running the, uh, the community program um, and that was my introduction to coaching really. Um, yeah. I then went on and got my co- coaching badges. Um, I then became a tutor, an FA tutor um, assessor and then um, and then got the opportunity to, um, to take a job in Thailand um, with a, a team called BC Terra, um, and that was my sort of first introduction to, to coaching as a head coach. Mm-hmm. Um, I was at the, uh, the tender age of 29. Wow, yeah. And what was that experience like for you, uh, Jason, sort of working in Thailand? I mean, I've, I've you know, been to Thailand myself a few times and on the way to Australia and back to the UK, and, you know, it's a really interesting place, and I've watched a few Thai boxing fights. But what's it like coaching football over there? Well, it was an interesting one, really. I was, as I said, I was working in the UK, and I went on my father was national coach of, uh, of the Thailand national team, and I went on holiday. Um, and got approached by one of the uh, the Premier League teams who who offered me a job as head coach. And as I said, I was 29 at the time, and you know I wasn't really thinking of, uh, of of coaching abroad. And it was a, an opportunity that I thought I would I would do. It was, it was a two year contract, and it, it turned into eight years being abroad at that time. It was wow. uh, about quite quite a good success. It was um, the, the team that you know they were. The, Sort of the Man City of the Premier League invested quite heavily, and their their beat was to win the league. The first year we missed out the league on goal difference, and the second year we won the league and the FA Cup. So it was uh, it was quite a successful two years, mm. and then that took me on to uh, on to Singapore, um, and I worked with the team over there, and then it was back to Thailand with the Thai national team. Went with my father, mm-hmm. um, and then it was worked with a, a, another Premier League team in the in Thailand, so it was, um, yeah, it was, it, it was interesting, it was, at the time, um, football in Thailand was, was still growing, um, I would say technically the Thai players are very, very gifted, physically, um, tactically, probably need a, a little bit of improvement on that side, but it was, uh, no, I thoroughly enjoyed it, you know, it was, uh, it was a great experience and it wouldn't be something that I would, uh, I'd want to change really, and I'm, I'm still coaching abroad now. Absolutely, and I mean, sort of before we sort of talk about what you're doing now, I'm just just curious around sort of Thailand, the level that you feel that. What would you say the level would be at club uh, level and sort of national team level? There's probably not too many people better to sort of give us an indication. I know it's hard to compare, obviously, with with the UK, but just a rough indication. Where would you say so the team that you were coaching would sort of sit within the the UK uh, leagues? 
Um, yeah, I get asked this quite a lot, really. I mean, it's a completely different style of football yeah, because yeah. of the, the human, humidity and the heat. The build-ups are a, a lot more sort of slower. You know, there's not that sort of high intensity because of the heat, basically. Um, but, you, you know, if I had to put a, I would say sort of League One, maybe Championship. Um, but as I said, there's, there's many talented talented players over mm-hmm. there. They just, you know, they don't have the opportunity to travel because of the FIFA ranking, so it's not as if they can oh, just, you know, course, a talented yeah. player can, can walk into the Premier League. But there is a lot of talent out over that side of the world. Um, yeah. And now coaching, coaching the Philippines, there's a lot of, you know, sort of Philippine players who've got um, mixed passports so the you know, you know the the, the playing for the Philippines national team but also um, you know they've come from a background of you know some of them in Germans Filipino so there's quite a lot of them um, spread out the spread around the world really. Yeah I mean so that, speaking of the Philippines I mean what, what would you say I know once again it's difficult to compare standard, but the standard say from the the team you're at at the moment in the Philippines, how how would that compare to say you know Europe and the UK? I would say that league is slightly behind the uh, the Thai league, um, and we've just we've just taken part in the AFC Champions League, and we've probably got one of the, we had one of the toughest groups, um, and it was a bit of an eye open eye o- o- open already. We, we played the, the top Japanese team, top Chinese team. And, uh, top, top Korean team and we got smashed by the, the Korean team uh, 8 uh, we held our own against the, the, uh, Beijing uh, but they had a young team out so it was a um, you know just looking at the Philippine league in, in regards to Asia it's, it's quite a lot, long way behind the Japanese the Korean the Chinese and probably slightly behind the Thai, Thai league but it's, it's, it's a growing league um, you know, this, the team that I'm with, there, um, there's some good investors who, are, um, who want to take the team forward. So it's, um, you know, it's an interesting project that I'm in, uh, involved in at the moment. But uh, again, if you compare it to the European, it, you know, it's, it's completely different. It's a mm-hmm. different build-up, different sort of style of play. But, you know, again, I'd probably say it's sort of League One standard. Yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, obviously, you know, like you said, there's many different variables, certainly the heat, humidity, and other things as well. In terms of the, the, the players, say, in, in Thailand, the Philippines, Singapore, what, what's their general aspiration, uh, Jason? Do they sort of have a vision of maybe coming across to Europe or, uh, I mean, obviously Japan now has got a, a you know, very successful and, and, and you know, very strong league too. Is that what, what sort of do they aspire generally to do? Is, is sort of Europe something that they sort of aspire to do or maybe Japan or just get as high as they can in their own country? Um, yeah, I think if you speak to uh, certainly a lot of the Thai players, I think there's four players who play in the Japanese league at the moment. So their sort of aspirations is to play in the top leagues in Asia, mm. which would be the Japanese, the J League. Um, the problem with Europe is, that, as I said, the FIFA ranking, so they, you know they couldn't just walk into a, a championship team over there. Mm. Um, but yeah, I mean they've got aspirations to, to, to improve and to better themselves, but. Um, there's a big difference between the European leagues and the, and the I'd say the, certainly the Southeast Asian leagues. Physically, it's completely different. Yeah. Um, but technically, you know, working with these players, technically, you know, they're, they're very gifted. If you go, I mean, you, you said you've been on holiday to Thailand yourself, but it's it's one of those. It's, it's, a, it's a football nation. Um, everywhere you look on street corners, there's kids playing football, and they're all wearing the Man United shirts and the Liverpool shirts. Um, you know, it's quite interesting. I, you know, I remember me and my father when we were coaching the Thai national team. We remember us playing Arsenal and just won the double. And um, you know, we turned up to the stadium and was stadium was full with eighty thousand people. And, and this is eighty thousand Thai people all wearing like, Arsenal shirts. And, and Arsenal scored, and they went the Thai uh, fans went crazy. And we managed to score, and they just give us a sort of a, a, a nice sort of round of applause. And we're looking around, thinking, "Hang on a minute, this is the Thai. This is your." Your team have just scored against Arsenal, and you've given us a round of applause. And, wow. and Elka was scoring, and they were sort of cheering because they wanted to see Obama score at the Vienna. We were like, hang on a minute, you're meant to be supporting your own nation. Absolutely, <laughs> yeah, not, yeah. Uh, not supporting them. Yeah, no, so, I mean, that's, so, I guess that's sort of that sort of tendency to be fair. I mean, when the when the sort of Premier League do tour Asia and certainly Australia, some of the the fans do actually support the club or at least appreciate the club um, to be able to watch the club. But what I found interesting on on, on Thailand, I sort of a few years ago, I saw a, a game 
just on TV. It was against Australia. And I was quite surprised, to be honest, um, Jason, the sort of technical ability they had. And I think it surprised a few people. I, I, I wouldn't say the, the, you know, the, the, the team was surprised. The Australian team was surprised. They knew. But I think some of the people watching it probably were surprised at the technicality. Do, 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 sort of, do you think sometimes that maybe in Europe and around the world, we don't really see a lot of Asian football? Maybe underestimate how, how you know, we saw in the World Cup, Korea... Um, do really well, South Korea do well, we've seen Japan do really well. Do you think sometimes we can underestimate the ability because we don't sort of see a lot of it on TV? Yeah, you know, as I said, the, the kids are playing on the street corners. I think if you look at, you know, you go back to the UK and kids are not playing on the street corners. You know, when I was growing up, we, we played on the street, we played in the park, but kids are not sort of doing that now. And, you know, so you, you, know you, you go to Thailand and you, you'll see them playing those small little games and you know jumpers for goalposts and well not necessarily jumpers in Thailand but uh, mm. you know small sort of yeah, goals yeah. and small sort of two v two you, you don't see that in, in the UK anymore unfortunately but certainly in Thailand you, you you'll see that and they won't be playing with a size five ball they'll be playing with a small ball yes um, so they you know you find the technique is is, is, is pretty good at, you know as I said I, I remember us playing Arsenal and. Their midfield at the time was Vieira Petit, um, and we had two guys, two tight, tight players in midfield who would turn them inside out, really. But physically, you know, when that ball was in the air, Petit and Vieira were, were overpowering them. But when the ball was on the floor, you know, they couldn't compete with them, really. And that, you know, that just sums up what sort of Asian football is like. Yeah. Um, but it's, yeah, and again, it's just, it's just giving them that opportunity. It's, it's not something that, that culturally, it's a big, big ask for them because to go over to Europe and the climate's completely different, the food's yeah. completely different. So it's, it's sort of a big ask for them. You know, when we were, you know, working with the national team, we said we should go over, but they should go over into the twos and threes so they can sort of support each other. Absolutely, um, yeah. But it's, uh, as I said, they've, they've certainly got the talent. It's, um, it's just given them that stage and that opportunity, really. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's, it, I mean, you know, we've certainly seen Japan and and, and in sort of recent years, um, and and sort of you know, the Korean team, um, we sort of see some of their players playing in Europe, um, even domestic league. It solely keeps in, improving, uh, that's for sure. But you know, for yourself, in terms of um, sort of travelling and, and coaching around the world, and what are some of the biggest sort of challenges you would say um, that you've experienced um, like working in different places? I think for me, uh, the main thing is, is the gist of the culture. I think if, yeah. you know, if you're going in there with a the mindset of, you know, I was you know, sort of brought up in UK football, if, you, if you're going to go over and, and have the mindset of everything's going to be exactly the same as, you know, championship teams or premiership teams, it's, it's not going to be like that at all. So you've got to reduce yourself to the culture. You've got to reduce yourself to the people. Um, you know, it's not one of those you can come and say, you know, I'm going to do things my way. We're, that's the way I've been brought up. You know, you've got to get some buy-in from the locals, um, and you've got to be, you know, adaptable to sort of change yourself, really. And that's, you know, as I said, I've, I've worked in sort of Asia a long time now, and it's it's, it's adapted number one to the culture. Um, mm-hmm. But they do want you to bring that sort of expertise, that foreign expertise in. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's just getting that adaptation of, of, of you know you, your culture and also mixing it up with their culture, really. Absolutely, and, and in terms of highlights for you, Jason, obviously you've sort of been working abroad for a long time now. What are some of the sort of highlights that stick to mind for you in, in your career thus far? Um, I'll probably go back to when I first, first went out to Thailand. It was, um, it was working with it, and I've been coming to Beats and Terror, uh, Sassanero, now called uh, uh, Police Terror, playing in the, in the, in the uh, uh, T1, the Thai League. You know, as I said, the, the remit to me was they wanted to win the league. Um, it was known as the big spenders at the time, and it was, um, you know, it was a big sort of challenge because they hadn't won the league before. They'd just been newly promoted. Um, and as I said, we, we missed that goal difference the first year and won the double the second year. So it was, you know, it was a, it was a big highlight for me, really. Mm. Um, but I mean, you know, working in the different environments of Singapore, Thailand. Um, Indonesia, I work with the national team in Indonesia and now in the Philippines. It's, um, mm. it's just nice to see different different levels of football and also different cultures um, and different places and travelling around really. It's, uh, I'm currently living in Dubai, but trying to get into the Philippines a little bit. Um, so yeah, it's, it's lovely to see these 
different places, really. Mm. What, what I sort of find interesting, like yourself having sort of worked in yourself having worked in, in Asia, in terms of how how you would adapt as a coach. I mean, do you sort of find that different countries sort of, you know, be it culture and other variables, how you sort of communicate to the players? I mean, obviously football is is a universal game, but do you find that um, that you've got sort of to to adapt or different personalities in in different countries or how, how do you sort of go about doing that, uh, Jason? Um, yeah, I mean, it can be difficult. I mean, in the Philippines, they all speak English, so it's not too bad. In Singapore, they all speak English. Um, in Indonesia and Thailand, they always work with translators. You know, as you say, it's a football, a football language. When you, when you coach on the coaching field, it's, it's a bit different because you can demonstrate what you want and you can sort of show pictures and you can you, know, you can use the whiteboard of you know show players what you want them to do um, but to be fair I've, I've kept my coaching very much the same really you know mm. it's, it's, it's always been geared to what we're doing on a Saturday you know so I always keep it related to uh, the game you know I don't, I don't you know the technical sort of side of league to the other coaches the fitness side of league to the fitness coach um, obviously the goalkeeping side of league to the goalkeeping coach and I just get I just work really on the tactical side of things of showing pictures of really what, how we want to play and how we want to set up and it might be adjusted to the, the opposition that we're playing mm-hmm. um, and, they're, and they're always very receptive you know it's long as you get those messages of what you want them to do mm-hmm. um, you know that, and the different cultures I've worked in they've all been very receptive um, you know, I find that working with players, they want to learn, they want to improve, and it's, it's exactly the same whether you work in the UK or Thailand, you know, Singapore, Philippines, or Indonesia. They mm-hmm. all want to improve as a player, um, and play at the highest level, um, and it's just trying to improve those players and give them the tools to, to be able to improve. Absolutely, and, and and with yourself, obviously having sort of qualifications too. Do you think that's been sort of really beneficial? I mean, for any sort of young coach listening, sort of contemplating studying and learning, you, you know, yourself that you got the pro license, and do you think that's sort of been really beneficial for you to have that and to to, to be able to sort of you know um, to be able to go the extra mile with with the players and, and transmit the information across as well. Um, I just felt it was important for me as an individual to improve yeah. myself. You know, whatever industry you're working with, you want to be as highly qualified as possible. But you know, I remember when I first started out in Thailand, I went back to England uh, for a for pre-season for a holiday, and you know, sat around doing nothing. I thought I'm not going to do that again. Next time I go back, I'm going to make sure to do a, a qualification or I do something that's beneficial, whether it's going to watch somebody else uh, working. And the, the following year, when I went back, I went and did my goalkeeping. Um, B license um, wasn't a goalkeeper. I'd never played in goal, but it was something that I just wanted to, you know, just keep learning. I just kept my education up. Um, and I think I've, I've done my pro license in 2006, but I was working in Indonesia, so it was quite difficult to get backwards and forwards to the UK working working abroad. But it was just important to, uh, to you know, try and keep qualified, but also you know, keep learning. Mm. Sometimes when you're living abroad and you're working abroad it's a bit difficult to, to keep that education going but I just felt it was important to uh, to keep learning and I think as a coach you're, you're still keeping up with ideas and new ideas of, of you know what's going on in football at this moment in time. No, absolutely and in terms of the staff I mean do you have like a, a, a sort of staff that work with you are they are they from Europe and the UK or do you have like local coaches as well or is it a blend of both I mean I would imagine the coaches over there would sort of appreciate obviously yourself who's got a lot of qualifications and experience in in your uh, UK as well um, are the sort of coaches a blend of both or uh, when I first went out it was work with the local coaches um, you know I was basically giving coaches it was you know this is your goalkeeper coaches the assistant coaches this is um, you know your kit man whatever um, and I was happy to do that and I think they were all quite receptive to want to learn um, you know I, I sort of w- would would tap into their knowledge on the, on the culture side of things and the players because you know they're the one communicating with the players so if there's any issues they'd come to me with you know it's important for them to keep in touch with the players and find out what's going on and they're happy with certain things so you know, I've worked with many, many different uh, um, coaches in different sort of nationalities, but it's, I would say probably the most important thing is if, you, if you're not speaking the language, the, get the interpreter right is really, really important. I've worked with a, with a translator who wasn't quite 
get the technical sort of information across mm-hmm. to the players, which I didn't find out until sort of six months into <laughs> into the into uh, working with the team. But it was actually one of the players who came to me and said, you know, we spoke English and said, you know, the interpreter is not interpreting exactly what you're saying, and, wow. and that sort of is really important. Yeah. So it was a it was a quick change, and I, I said to the player, well, you're going to do the uh, translation from now. Yeah, so I, I, once we did make that change, it was. Uh, the players sort of understood me a lot, a lot better. I think it was, it was one of them. I was pulling my hair out, thinking, "Hang on a minute!" I've told him and told him, although I wasn't telling him. The translator was telling him, and uh, he wasn't sort of getting the information, the, the correct information across. So, you know, if you're going to work with the translator, it's really important. That the right one, really. Yeah, no, absolutely, and it sort of goes to show. I mean, everyone sort of coaches from abroad come to the UK and. And, and they're sort of learning the language, how these sort of things sometimes, I suppose even in you know press conferences and things like that, really things would be sort of, <laughs> it'd be really important to have someone who sort of gets the message across uh, in, in the right way as well. But I mean, in, on the show, we have a lot of listeners who are um, also sort of aspiring coaches, coaches, and I know it's difficult to give, you know, any sort of advice, but so any, any point as to any coach, Jason, who is sort of, contemplating or he's on their way to working abroad in in Asia is there any sort of things that you sort of think that might be um, of, of use for them with obviously all the experience you have um, there might be a couple of takeaways for them you know if they're sort of tuning in they're on the way out there or they already are or contemplating it uh, yeah I mean the first thing is you know just make sure you're qualified um, make sure you do a recce of the place first to see if yeah. you like it you know it's got to work both ways you know sometimes I've seen players and, and coaches uh, move to Thailand I was quite lucky because I was always sort of in and around Bangkok there was a couple of times I was outside Bangkok but you've just got to be aware of um, you know the environment you're working in because you know some of these places outside you know I take Thailand as an example some of them outside of Bangkok you could be in the middle of nowhere mm-hmm. where you've got no sort of you know Western restaurants around you or anything like that. And, you know, you've just signed a two-year contract, which you might think is great, but you know, it's, it's, a, it's a big ask if you you know you haven't got those familiar surroundings around you. So I would personally don't do a recce first. Um, you know, and if I, I'd find out the aspirations of the of the club really and what what your expectations are of them and what their expectations are of you. Because that's going to be a you know I've seen a lot of coaches go out you know in Asia and. They, they, they tend to not last very long, and they go back. You know, they go back within sort of six months, and they're, and they're back in the, you know, in their own sort of environment they came from. So it's, it's, you know, being able to adapt to that culture, but it's also being comfor- comfortable in that environment that you're actually in. No, absolutely. And I mean, one thing you've made—it's a really good point too. And I think on top of that, you know, certainly the, you know. Um, they, they, and the other side to it too, I mean, what I found in, in, in some of the, the countries like, you know, they, they don't sort of suffer fools. They know if you know your stuff as well. So it's a smaller world and, yeah. and, and they are very knowledgeable. They sort of, they'll find you out as well. Do you, do you find that's the case in your experience where sort of, you know, sometimes you do get people, uh, you know, going out there, but maybe underestimating how knowledgeable they are as well? Oh, absolutely. You know, it's, um, you know, you, if they're bringing it over a foreigner, they're, they're looking at this as quite a big expense. And if you've got to keep bringing someone to the table, really, then it's, they're looking at you as thinking, well, actually, you're just as good as a, a you know, a local coach. So you won't last very long. And it's the same with players, really. You know, we, when we're signing a foreign player, they've got to be better than the local players because they're getting sort of double the salary of what a local players get. So you've really got to bring someone to the table. I'd say, you know, on a coach's point of view as well, just be really careful of it on the contract you sign because a lot of them they, they want you to sign with this, this uh, you know a two month clause where they can get rid of you and you know they're quite easy to hire and fire over there and it's um, if a few games go against you you know just pay you might think that you're signing a two or three year contract but actually you're signing a, a two month contract where you lose a couple of games and they can easily sack you and there's two months money and then you go you're back, you know you're you're back to where you sort of started really so mm-hmm. you know it's going to be a, a two year contract and make sure it's a two year contract Absolutely, a three year yeah. contract make sure it's a three year contract because I've seen a lot of coaches that come over and they sign a three year contract and actually there's a clause in the contract when they can get rid of you and give you a payout for two months so effectively you do sign on a two month contract yeah, no, so that's a great uh, point. I mean, I'm sure that 
you know that, that, that's a really good point in terms of doing due diligence before you know going out there that's for sure and uh, that's, that's certainly a big deal I'm sure a lot of the younger coaches will appreciate sort of having a think about that um, you know I, I suppose in life it's too good to be true it's probably too good to be true in that respect too but in terms of yourself your, your own vision I'm sure you've got you know goals and I'm sure plenty of them you'll sort of keep uh, you know close to your chest but is there anything you can sort of share in terms of where, where you sort of your own vision going forward more I suppose you've achieved a lot so far and I'm sure you've got plenty more things you want to achieve, Jason. Or um, it's one of those. I, you know, it wasn't something that you know I had aspirations to work abroad. I, as I said, I yeah. went on holiday. My, my father's worked with the Thai national team at the time, and I just went to visit him and just got offered a position out there. And I thought, well, there's no harm in doing this for two years. And as I said, two years turned into eight years, and then I was back to the UK, and then I was, I was back in Asia again. So it was, it's not something where I planned it out, and I think. Sometimes I listen to coaches saying, oh yeah, I'm going to plan out, I'm going to work here and work yeah, there. Yeah. It doesn't work like that. You know, sometimes you, 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 know, you, you might get sacked from a certain position and all of a sudden you, you, you know, you've got to think again of where you want to go or what you want to do. And it's, it's, um, I've been offered work, some, some jobs I've turned down and, I've, you know, and, and other jobs have been quite attractive and I thought, right, I, I fancy giving that a go. So it's, um, it's been open-minded and, and open to offers and, and, and listening. It's got to be a good fit, not just for, for them, but also for you as well. You know, mm. certain places I've, I've been offered work and thought, no, that's not for me. I don't fancy that. And, uh, and I've walked away from certain, certain contracts that didn't really fit in with me, really. So mm. Mm. just having that open-mindedness. But I've not really had a, a plan of, right, in six years' time, I'm going to be working in the Premier League or whatever it is. It's, it's, it's just sometimes it's it's following the work and if, if it's something that interests you or you, you, you think it's a, a challenge, then, you know, you take it on or you don't take it on. Absolutely, yeah, no, exactly. It's, it's, I mean, I suppose as a coach, it's like, you know, best laid plans and sometimes you've got to just go with, uh, go with it and just see uh, what happens, that's for sure. But it's been really interesting speaking to you, Jason. I'm sure the listeners have really... Um, you know, found that you know fascinating. You know your experiences, and, and, and no doubt that you know you, you could probably uh, write a few books on all your experiences. Um, but I really want to appreciate you coming aboard the show and sort of sharing your, your, your insights into uh, into coaching around the world or around Asia um, and, and the UK as well. That was Jason with you, a pro licensed coach, who has kindly uh, joined us all the way. Um, all yes. Sorry, JC, we just dropped off. Yeah, I was just saying, we really want to thank you for coming aboard the show, and it's been fascinating for me and, and know that listeners too. So, yeah, really, really interesting. I was just saying that no doubt that uh, you could probably write a, a whole book. We could probably do a show uh, for as long as, 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 as whenever, really. But uh, I want to thank you for your time, and we wish you all the best in, uh, in, 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 in your sort of future endeavors. And that was Jason Weir. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Good was- to speak. You too. That was Jason uh, with UEFA Pro Licensed Coach who's coaching at uh, United City in the Philippines who's sort of given us a really fascinating insight into his experiences in, in Asia and, and how he got there and, and, and no doubt a number of takeaways for the different, uh, well, you know, coaches or any profession really listening. Um, no doubt would have found that really interesting. Gone 94.5 FM, South City Raider, the Friday Sports Show, your host, Jimmy Petruzzi.